So in this sense, a film is the medium that is most susceptible to improvement, but sculpture is the medium that is least susceptible to improvement. Once it's done, it's done, and which is why for the Greeks, uh, eternal values were something that they promulgated, and sculpture was perfectly consistent with that idea of eternal values. And so he says that in an age in which uh, media like film are on the rise, which tend to um, w exhibit this room for improvement, sculpture is the, definitely a medium that we, we would see disappearing during that time. <clears throat> So then he goes on to say that uh, to photograph a painting is a reproduction of a work of art, but to photograph um, people in a studio uh, standing in front of a camera, what is going on there is not the reproduction of a work of art. A film is not a work of art until it's assembled in the, in the uh, editing stage. It's the montage aspect. It's the putting together of the images that construct it as a work of art. And then he says that the... Um, that uh, the actor on stage acts in front of an audience, but in the case of the film, the actor acts in front of a crew of experts and technicians who are always standing by and can intervene in his performance at any time. And he says this is basically a microcosm for what we're all subjected to in the society of mechanization. Uh, the worker at the assembly line <clears throat> is constantly having, having to test himself or herself against the apparatus, and if the person fails, then they're excluded from the factory. Uh, and so the actor, too, is tested uh, in front of the apparatus. He's constantly being tested in front of it. Um, and as the result of that, when the audience goes to see the film, what they're seeing is a successful test of the actor against the machine, as the actor asserting his humanity on behalf of everyone else, and achieving a kind of revenge on the machine. So already at this point in the essay, we, we can begin to see how Benjamin thinks of film uh, as a revolutionary medium in the Marxist sense, since Benjamin was a Marxist, that is consistent with uh, what the masses want. It, it's consistent with a mass audience and giving the power back to the mass audience. Um, and then so he goes on from there is to say that... Um, Though the stage actor identifies himself with a role, and the actor on stage has an, also has an aura about him, just like the traditional work of art, and the actor on stage has that aura, but the actor that is filmed in front of the camera has the aura stripped away from them, does not have the aura, uh, because the process of filming them and assembling these images, uh, films are very rarely filmed in chronological order, uh, this random collection of images tends to strip from the actor his aura. I think Benjamin made a big mistake here and did not understand the essentially and inherently myth-making power of film itself. If we think of uh, the great celebrities like James Dean or Marilyn Monroe or Marlon Brando, these are actors who were given their aura by the power of film itself. And this is something Marshall McLuhan understood and talked about in his work uh, that I think is a necessary corrective to Benjamin here in the sense that what McLuhan understood is that what media do, especially media like advertising, advertising takes banal objects from the common mundane world and transforms them simply by putting them into a different context, the context of the medium of advertising into fetish objects that glow with a kind of numinous value to them. Same thing with film. Film, he says, retrieves Plato's cave. In the daytime process, there's a day aspect to film which dissects reality, slices and carves it up, and then in the nighttime reconstruction of this, the images are put together and it's projected into Plato's cave, the modern movie theaters, uh, Plato and Hollywood join hands on the sands of uh, the beaches of California, and myth creates, uh, film creates myths. That is precisely what it does. It has a myth-making potential to it uh, that Benjamin missed here, I think. Uh, it does not strip the aura from the actor, uh, just the opposite. It might strip the aura, I think he got it right, that it does tend to strip the aura from traditional works of art. Nobody wants to go see the Mona Lisa when you've seen it on every coffee cup and t-shirt all over the world. Who wants to go see it? So it does, it does tend to destroy the aura of traditional works. Um, <clears throat> so anything, I, anyhow, I think you got that point wrong. So then he goes on to talk about how... And to talk about how he did get right the fact that what another aspect the film does is it works kind of like a mirror in that it creates this mirror image that takes the mirror image of the actor and makes it portable by putting it in front of the masses. Uh, he did get that right. That is what generates the image avatar of the actor. 
and from that point on it begins to take on it, its own life. Uh, he did get that much, he definitely got that right. Um, and then he talks about the democratic aspect of film, which is another interesting uh, prophetic aspect. He says that there's another aspect of film today that has a potential in it such that anyone can be filmed. And he says this democratization power of film uh, began to come in in the other media at the end of the 19th century, in magazines in particular, for example, where um, people writing letters to the editor could be included in the production process. The average uh, reader uh, could write in uh, letters to the newspaper and, and have those things be those pieces of writing incorporated into these media. And that film contains the same potential, especially if you look at the Russian films, he says, of the, uh, of the, the communists, the films like Eisenstein's October, where he's filming the, the average person out in the field doing their farm work, or the workers in the factory doing their work, and they're just who they are, and they can incorporate anybody in the process. But he says that the problem with Hollywood film is that it's governed by capitalism, and capitalism, because it tends to create the star and the cult of the star as a commodity and, a, uh, and give it a kind of cult value, impedes this process, uh, that which would work better if film were, uh, more, had a more communist Marxist approach to it, in which anyone could participate in it. Uh, it's almost as though he were saying that film is almost like an early version of the internet. And I think what happens, obviously what happens later with the internet is a fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, but the thing about that Benjamin misses here is that uh, the internet, which favors the participation of anyone in the creative process. On Amazon, anyone can be a book reviewer. On YouTube, anyone can make a film uh, and become a director. Um, you know, anyone with Photoshop can create images and so forth. It democratizes these tr the cult of the star, as Andy Warhol was the first to see, is democratized by the power of these media such that anyone who steps in front of a camera can become famous for their 15 minutes. And I think um, that Benjamin missed that this did come out of capitalism itself. It came out of the inner exigencies of capitalism. Uh, and so Marxists need not apply. Um, so then he moves on to say, the next point that he makes is that um, that the technological rep reproducibility of the artwork changes the relation of the masses to art, whereas painting is traditionally an art form uh, that is directed to an elite, a small audience, traditionally, um, and generally excludes the masses from, particip from participation. Film, by its very nature, includes the masses and in, in, in favors them, um, which seems to me to be a rather obvious point. I mean, he's basically saying film is a popular art. It, it, panders to the masses and it's a popular art, um, unlike the elitism of, of traditional art. Um, then he makes another point that anticipates McLuhan here, where he says that the most important social function of film is to establish equilibrium between human beings and the apparatus. This antip anticipates McLuhan's later point that what art does is it reestablishes and recalibrates the disturbed sense ratios in a society that are thrown out of whack by constant new media. Um, every time new technology comes along, it throws the sense ratios out of, out of whack, disturbs everyone, and the job of the artist is to create a counter environment to this new environment that will then make visible what is going on beneath the surface, and it will readjust and recalibrate uh, a society's sense ratios. And so he says here that um, one of the things that film does is that it, it, it makes visible uh, it brings out of our subliminal awareness into the threshold of consciousness what he calls the optical unconscious, which is different from the instinctive unconscious of Freud and Jung. The optical unconscious is that in, in close, in, in doing close-ups and slow motion and examining uh, aspects of reality that we normally miss, so how our hand picks up a lighter uh, and there are certain facets of it that we miss, it brings these things into close-up and begins to make them visible for us. It brings them into our conscious awareness, which is different from the uh, instinctive unconscious. But not only does it do that, but it also creates, it's able to create an altered sense of perception such that if we want to see how a psychotic sees the world, film does that for us. It enables us uh, to extend our sense perceptions in new ways that bring hitherto hidden aspects of reality uh, into prominence before us. Uh, and then he finishes up this point by saying that film contains the potential 
within it to act as a kind of psychic immunization uh, against through through showing things like masochistic fantasies and sadistic fantasies and it immunizes the audience against such mass psychoses as fascism um, the comic relief provided by the films of Chaplin and Disney trigger therapeutic releases of unconscious energies in the audience thereby immunizing them uh, against mass hysterias and so forth so that's an interesting point a debatable one I think but it's very interesting and he says that Dadaism tried to do this same thing with painting but failed because it's not something that painting is normally designed to do uh, the, the new changes in perception that are happening with the rise of mass society need a mass medium like film to capture those changes and traditional arts like painting won't do it um, So that's that, and then he says that, um, then he finishes by talking about the difference between what he calls concentration and distraction, and the traditional arts uh, favor concentration to such a degree that the spectator concentrating on the work, uh, you may get like a ch the Chinese fable of the individual who concentrated so hard on the work that he went inside of it, and he became, you know, part of it. Whereas the masses, on the other hand, in the, in the case of distraction, simply absorb the media into them. And the age of distraction also favors this, this kind of, he says, reception and distraction um, <clears throat> finds in film its true training ground. So it really is a medium that is conducive to, to the masses and favors them. And then he finishes off uh, by saying that, by talking about fascism and saying that the logical outcome of fascism is an aestheticizing of political life. And this aestheticizing of political life tends to lead, it leads to war, and the glorification of war, and the mobilization of technology in the service of war, while retaining in place private property, property structures, and property relations that exclude the masses from participation in them, while mobilizing war. Uh, whereas <clears throat> a pop art form like film uh, politicizes art. It's, a it's an art form that has revolutionary potential, that politicizes art, which is what communism is, Instead of aestheticizing politics, it politicizes art and it favors the masses. Um, and I think here, the essay, that's how the essay ends, and I think that the interesting thing about it is that there's a lot of ambivalence uh, in it, in um, Benjamin's attitude toward the impact of modern technology on traditional art. Clearly he thinks that modern technology has a dis disintegrative effect on traditional art. It leeches the aura from tr traditional works of art. But on the other hand, um, it, when we're talking about popular arts like film, Benjamin clearly loves film, and uh, he sees it as having new potentials for the age of the masses, um, potentials that can liberate it from any kind of fascistic enslavement. And I think that in this respect, Adorno, his friend, is going to disagree with him very much. I think Adorno in the culture industry sees the entirety of the culture industry as basically another kind of displaced fascism. Uh, the total organization of society by fascism gets displaced into the popular arts and the culture industry, uh, which tends to not create, not to bring the audience in a participatory way in, but to numb them and pacify them and turn them into cattle while this stuff is force-fed onto them, and they can simply be manipulated from that point on. Uh, so I think that there's an interesting contrast between Benjamin's approach to pop culture and Adorno's, who is much more dismissive of it. And indeed, when Adorno went to live in LA uh, to flee the Nazi outbreak, he was absolutely horrified by American life in L.A. It just sickened him, and uh, he didn't like it at all. But Benjamin had a, a much more positive attitude toward it. So um, that's the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility.